Dr. Amdekar, during your more than 35 years practice as a pediatrician, you have seen children from every section of society in public and private hospitals and in your own private practice. In other words, you've conducted thousands of conversations with parents. So in your experience, what role does the dialogue between the doctor and the parents play in the success of the treatment? I think uh, more than just a medical prescription of drugs, it is very important to communicate with parents about the child's illness, about why it happened, about the possible progress in anticipation and what is expected out of drug therapy. I think unless we are very clear with the parents and parents understand you better, there is no clear liaison between the doctor and the parents and I think a lot of success of therapy lies in a good communication. To achieve this kind of success, doctor, certain skills would be required. Are physicians trained in the skills for talking effectively with patients? I think uh, in general the physicians are not trained for this skills of communication. And one learns only when one gets out to practice and actually face the situation. Though things are changing to a small extent, and I know institutions who care to train their students for a better skills of communication, but in general, I would agree that physicians are not trained mostly and they learn by themselves over their own experience. In a physician's practice, doctor, of course you will see a variety of conditions among children. Which conditions in particular would require detailed discussions with parents? I think largely in childhood practice we face three types of situations. One, where the disease is very chronic and would certainly deserve a cooperation from the parents and the child for a success of treatment. If that is so, then a good communication is very vital. Another area, of course, is where a child has a serious illness and the parents need to understand the seriousness of the disease. And finally, if the disease is rather incurable by a present mode of therapy, parents need to know that they expect not a cure but surely some control. Doctor, you mentioned specifically chronic conditions and ones that are incurable and require long-term treatment. Among these chronic conditions which affect children, is there a rise in the prevalence of asthma? Yes, very much. Uh, I think this rise uh, sometimes is felt as apparent because uh, today's physicians and the parents are much aware of a possibility of a child who is coughing is likely to be an asthmatic. However, I'm sure there is also a real uh, increase in the prevalence of asthma due to varieties of reasons and the trigger factors that maybe we are likely to come in contact with. And much more so if you are affluent because the affluence brings in also a lot of such trigger factors inevitably. And I think uh, asthma is certainly on the increase. The IAP Respiratory Chapter publication, which is Asthma by Consensus, says At the first consultation, give the patient your time more than your prescription. Could you please explain that concept? Uh, I think uh, when the parents see a doctor for any element in their child's life, uh, they merely expect a drug to do wonders. And I think a disease like asthma has certainly a limitation of only drugs curing a child or controlling the child. Therefore, there is a lot beyond merely drug therapy. Wherever there is something beyond a drug therapy, a mere prescription won't help. And the parents must know many other factors that will go a long way in controlling their child's illness. This needs a lot of uh, communication and an easy understanding by the parents alone would make the parents also contribute to the success of drug therapy. And I think asthma is a classical example where a drug therapy alone will fail, but if it is a good communication to the parents, make them understand their role in the ultimate success of therapy, then I think the drugs will work wonders. There are some conditions where the drug alone works, like a simple acute tonsillitis but not in an asthma. And I feel equal or probably more than equal uh, help comes from the parents to control the child's illness. And that's where I think a good communication is so vital. Right, doctor. Just as you see very wide variety of conditions among children, you meet a very wide cross-section of people. 
How do you overcome the challenge of explaining technical details to parents? That's right. I I think uh, uh, most important part of a skills of communication lies in uh, giving uh, simple ideas and often similarities that the parents are familiar with. For example, an asthma is an allergic condition. Now it's easy for me to tell the parents what allergy is if I compare it with say a short temper. I tell the parents that if somebody is short tempered, he's born with that kind of temper and what is short temper? He flares up with a small trigger that most of the others don't flare up. It's called a short temper. So I tell them that in an asthma, your child's respiratory tract is short tempered. So you don't flare up, but your child does with the same trigger factor. And therefore, if he's born with this short temper, you just can't help it, but you can still avoid trigger factors. Like if you have a short tempered person, you try to be very polite to him. You try not to instigate him. And then he is not short tempered in his behavior. So once you consider a similarities, Allergy means a lot of sense to them and they also understand that it is something that the doctor will not be able to take away from the child but even then a short tempered person can be made to behave coolly if nobody instigates him. And finally I tell them that like they would have known a short tempered young adult cooling himself down over years and as an old person they would say that, look, in his young age, he was very short-tempered. Many allergies also would cool down over time, provided the child is not exposed to the triggers. Now, these kind of similes make it easy for them to understand. Further, I tell them that when a person is short-tempered, he gets red, he trembles. This respiratory tract also, getting short-tempered, has a redness, swelling and trembles. What does it mean? He starts coughing. And if you further aggravate his situation, he even gets breathless. That is a simile between the temper and the behavior of a person to a short-tempered respiratory tract. And I think that makes sense to majority of them. And they understand what you mean. Finally, I tell them that this is there for something that you live with. However, if you take care of the trigger factors and the proper drugs, this manifestation of short-tempered respiratory tract can be well under control. Once I give a simile like this, the technical issues like the word allergy gets easily understood by parents. And finally, I tell them that a word allergy is also used in English, that oh, I'm allergic to that person, which means I don't like him, I react to his presence. If you keep on coming in contact with such a person frequently, you would manifest more and more hatred. But if you don't see him for a long time and thereafter you meet him, you may not flare up at his only vision. Therefore, allergy is also similar. If you meet this allergic trigger factors every day, you flare up more and more. But if you keep away from trigger factors, maybe occasionally when you meet it, you may not flare up. I think with this kind of similes, they understand the technical jargon of allergy, hyperreactivity, bronchospasm, and finally an asthma. And I think this is the way we need to communicate with parents. Uh, That was very clear, doctor. Thank you. But apart from the aspect of explanation, what is the reaction, the emotional reaction of parents when they are told that their child has asthma? And how do you handle that? I think uh, most of them wish that you don't say their child has asthma because it has its own stigma, it has its own fear and many times even if the parents themselves are asthmatic and they recognize their child having a similar illness, they prefer a doctor who says it's not asthma. But I think that is outright fooling the parents and it's against the child's well-being. Therefore, you need to certainly announce to them that the child has asthma. But there are ways to announce them. You need not bluntly say, look, your child has asthma and believe it or not, you have to live with it. That's not the way to put it. You would say that, look, this child has an allergy, a respiratory allergy, and that's how he's coughing. And sometimes he might even be breathless. 
and that is what is often called as asthma but don't get bogged down by that term it means very little people talk in different terms and therefore asthma in effect is simply something that your respiratory tract does not tolerate and therefore cries out with a cough more often at times with breathlessness and that is easy to control moment you add on such words they are reassured that even if it's asthma it's not that the heavens have fallen down and i think the way you put the same uh, statements in a different way coming out with few more statements to make and back up such a word i think helps so i certainly tell them it's an asthma and nothing else but i don't be blunt i i come around over 2 3 four statements and then come out to say but how does it matter it is controllable so it's just a label and a label means very little and most of them accept it so would it in any way be fair to not use the word asthma and to call it uh, bronchitis instead no not really because uh, it's very important that they understand that the child has a serious illness asthma is not to be taken lightly uh, and unless you convince them that it is a disease that is likely to cause trouble in future if not managed properly today i think the message does not reach the parents so it is much better to call asthma as asthma and not by bronchitis but i do recall occasions where the parents would come out and say that a previous doctor did say it is just bronchitis and i tell them that these are different words in different languages it means the same thing but by telling parents that it's asthma it clearly gives them a message that they have to follow a long term management and monitor whereas if you just say bronchitis they feel every other person gets bronchitis and they may even not take your medicines and your advice very seriously so while it might make the parents feel little upset it is very vital that you give them a specific term of asthma as asthma and not bronchitis in an asthmatic child doctor if the parents have never perceived wheezes it is difficult for them to believe the diagnosis of asthma how do you handle this i think majority of the parents feel that an asthma is equivalent to being breathless and again i use a simile i tell them that when a nose runs you call it cold but then sometimes the nose gets blocked therefore a nasal cold as the most of the parents understand has two ways of presentation one a running nose and another a blocked nose both means the same thing so when your nose is blocked and not running you still have a cold which needs treatment and when your nose is running everyone knows that there is cold just take the same simile to a bronchial tree and you would know that if a bronchial tree runs like a cold runs the child coughs because there are secretions and at times further if the disease worsens the bronchial tree gets blocked and it's only when it gets blocked you get breathless if it is not blocked but running that mean there are secretions then you cough so you would say that if you have a running nose you could possibly ease yourself very well by just either wiping your nose but if you have a blocked nose then you are uncomfortable and you need to act even much more similarly when the child coughs you need to act probably with ease but when the child is blocked and gets breathless i think the management is more difficult and the child is really more suffering so difference between a running nose and cold and a blocked nose and cold is a very appropriate to make them understand that what happens in the nose is very evident to lay parents similar thing is happening in the bronchial tree and it is the time that you have secretions and it is not blocked that you work up rather easily and more effectively then when it gets blocked and when you get breathless the management is more difficult and certainly the problem is more distressing to a child once i give this simile i think all parents understand what i mean and they know that a child of an asthma is coughing it is a better stage of management than a child who is wheezing 
or breathless, which apparently is an advanced stage of asthma. So I put it like this, that in an early stage of asthma, you just cough. And when this gets worse in severity, you are obstructed, then you even breathe hard. That is the way parents understand that without a wheeze, your child is coughing, still can have asthma, and they are happy to know this simile, which means to them that their child has an early, manageable stage of asthma. We have also seen there are many conditions in which people expect to go through some kind of confirmatory tests. So how do you answer parents who want some kind of confirmation that it is asthma? Uh, I think I tell them that largely asthma is a result of some trigger factors which cause an obstruction to breathing out. And therefore, ideally, you will have to measure the amount of air that is breathed out and then only you know whether it is an obstruction to breathing out. However, this is almost impossible in children especially below five or seven years of age. In an adult this may be possible. Therefore I tell them that you cannot prove beyond doubt that there is an obstruction to breathing out of air or exhalation and therefore the diagnosis is largely clinical and there are no simple tests to prove the point. But what one can consider in a clinical setting is typically an allergic disease is always suddenly appearing, recurring and suddenly disappearing. An allergy is called that. Again I tell the parents that they must have seen suddenly the hives coming up. Now hives come up suddenly, the child itches and then after some time they just disappear even to reappear somewhere else. So allergic diseases appear suddenly, disappear also and then recur as well and that is how an asthma does. That convinces them that yes, this is allergy. And a bronchoconstriction is a clinical diagnosis. At the most, the test may be required to satisfy a little anxious parents to say that let us confirm that there are no other diseases on probability. And therefore, at times when I find a parent who is very anxious, I tell them that while asthma cannot be easily proved in a younger child, by a laboratory test, we may consider proving my clinical diagnosis right by doing some tests which can rule out other common diseases like pneumonia, like tuberculosis and most of them are happy doing that. If you do a blood count and it demonstrates some eosinophilia, I think that adds on to your further confirmation of a probability of diagnosis and therefore most of them accept once you tell them that this is a limitation of a proof. However, a clinical judgment backed up by ruling out other diseases makes a lot of sense. Part 2 of the interview uh, Doctor, now we will move on to another key area in asthma management which is ensuring compliance. That's vitally important in a chronic condition like asthma. Could you tell us about effective ways to get parents to start treatment and continue it long term? For example, some parents hope that their child will grow out of asthma. They may want to delay starting treatment. How do you get them to start at the earliest? I think it's very important to tell them far more uh, information about the disease than the drugs to start with. Uh, their fear is about the drugs, whether they would harm the child. And they are least aware of what the disease can harm. Therefore, once I diagnose asthma, I first tell them that this is a disease in childhood, if controlled properly, will make an adult life much easier. However, if it is not well controlled in childhood, this very child may end up as an adult asthmatic, difficult to control. Because the disease by then goes on gradually worsening, and at that stage, however good the treatment could be, the management still has own limitation. So I convince them that the best time to treat asthma is during childhood. And I also make a mention that every adult asthmatic has been a child asthmatic, whether known, whether diagnosed, whether managed. There is no adult who suddenly props up to be asthmatic. And therefore an asthma starts in childhood. And if we control well, he would lead a normal adult life. I 
use a gentle but a little threatening statement to say that if a childhood asthma mm. is ignored he might land up in an kind of an irreversible situation in adulthood in spite of treatment and therefore to begin with i convince them that to prevent an adult problem which often is more severe and at times irreversible a good treatment of a childhood asthma is very very vital once i convince them that they understand that this has a long term repercussion on to an adult life and therefore they better follow the doctor's advice very very correctly now this is the first step not to threaten them outright but surely warn them adequately once i do that i tell them that some children do grow out of asthma but they grow out one because their disease has been rather mild and most important they are well managed and monitored so the chances of so called growing out is only when you manage them well and further i had to say that growing out is not getting out of asthma totally you remain to be asthmatic through life but without suffering and i give them an example that you may have a mild diabetes and you may not need any medication but you have to control your diet your weight your exercise program and your blood sugar remains just mildly raised you are a diabetic by any medical standard and you are fit and normal by every standard you could be a sufferer of a disease and yet not suffering and we aim to have an adult asthmatic who will be labeled as asthmatic medically but by symptoms he is as fit and normal as somebody who has no asthma to achieve this you need to have a good diagnosis early enough and a good treatment to follow and once i explain this to them they understand finally i tell them that even if a child is to grow out of asthma one thing he will grow out because he is managed properly and the second is till he is suffering from asthma he needs treatment whether one is growing out or not only the time would suggest but every one would need today a good treatment so one who is likely to grow out and a wishful thinking of every parent that their child would grow out would also demand a good treatment today irrespective of what is the future and the future is definitely established to be right if you treat them properly and i think this is the way i convince them that it's a long term treatment it's the need to treat correctly and there is a good chance that they may grow out grow out not of a label of asthma grow out of a trouble of asthma which is good enough and the parents need to kind of be convinced on such issues then most of them follow treatment so you mentioned uh, wishful thinking all said and done are there parents who still ask you whether there is a cure for asthma i think uh, my statement uh, to the parents on treatment of asthma once i convince them that the diagnosis is asthma starts with saying that there is no cure and i add further to say there is no cure in any pathy then i add on to say that there are children under my care who have grown out of asthma and such a parent when you meet he might direct you to me feeling that i have cured his child's asthma but the fact remains that he got cured naturally and more than cured controlled well because of a good advice by the doctor that was followed by the parents so asthma can be controlled very well but never theoretically cured what does that mean that if you go astray that you don't take proper treatment you don't follow proper control of trigger factors any time in life thereafter you may also be vulnerable to get back to where you started therefore medically you are never cured but in practical situation you are so well controlled that you are like almost cured finally i tell them what is the difference between cure and control while both of patients look alike one who is cured need not follow any restrictions or any advice from the doctor one who is well controlled is as good as cured provided he follows some restrictions and some advice that his doctors gives from time to time so both are equally fit one has to be a little more vigilant 
in following doctor's advice, not necessarily drug therapy, but advice in general. The other may be called cured when he has not to bother about anything. So today, asthma cannot be cured, but well controlled. Control is nearly equivalent to cure, provided control is backed up by the parental cooperation. And I tell them that control plus parental cooperation is nearly cure for all practical purposes. Uh, one key area where you need cooperation is in the modality of treatment. Do parents have concerns about giving their child the inhalation therapy? Yes, to begin with, yes. And uh, the first question that parents always ask is, would inhaler therapy mean an addiction? And I always tell them that if you drink a liquor in a cup of tea, you will still get addicted because the addiction is to the contents and not to the container. Then they understand it correctly. Then I tell them that this inhaler has a drug which is same as you have been giving orally and therefore it's the drug to which you may get addicted but not to the container. So how does it matter when you are very easily giving the same drug orally and happily that you feel afraid of an inhaler getting addicted is not true. Moment I confirm and convince them that they have understood that a drug is same, I make further inroads to convince them that the inhaler is the best way of treatment. Once the problem of addiction is solved, then I tell them that it's the same drug that I'm giving in a very small dose. So they are normally used to giving say astelin two milligrams, three times a day. And then when I tell them that I am ordering 100 or 200 micrograms instead of 2 milligrams, they understand the dose is 1 tenth or 1 twentieth. And then I tell them why do I give us such a small dose? Because it reaches the site where it should work. So I tell them that when you take a spoonful of astelin, it goes in your stomach through the bloodstream, it goes to every organ in the body and a small part also goes to the bronchial tree and helps you out but the large part also goes to a liver, the brain, the kidneys and every organ unnecessarily. And when it goes there unnecessarily, first thing it does not have any benefit, but the second thing is it may cause side effects. Whereas if a small concentration of a same drug is delivered simply to the bronchial tree, one thing is I'm giving a very small dose, another is I'm getting a quick benefit in five minutes which otherwise on an oral treatment takes 30 minutes and there are hardly any side effects because hardly any drug is reaching to other side. Once I convince them that there is no addiction, the drug is same, drug is in very small concentration and the drug is delivered at the site of illness, I end up this discussion telling them that it is like putting an eye drops in an eye disease or putting a skin ointment to a skin disease. Would you imagine an oral drug for a conjunctivitis? or an oral drug for a skin element, it's a local drug. Why? Because it's accessible for a local drug reaching there. Today, a modern ways of inhalation has made a drug easily accessible to the site of the bronchial tree. And therefore, if an ear drops, eye drops and a skin ointment is an accepted way of modality of treatment in such diseases, today's treatment of asthma has to be local. Finally, I end up telling them that have you ever asked your eye specialist what would be the side effects like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, etc. when you put an eye drops and they realize that they have never even bothered to ask of side effects because they imagine and know that how can there be a side effect when the drug is only reaching the site of disease. And the same is true here that when I reach the drug at the site of disease and nowhere else, there is no question of side effects in general. However, if you misuse a drug in large number of dosages, in large amount, over a large time, nothing is safe. But this drug and this modality is the best available and I end up finally saying that it's a crime to treat a disease which is easily accessible to a local treatment by an oral or a general treatment. And when I put up this way, I think every parent has agreed to use inhalers. Coming specifically to inhaled corticosteroids, which are a cornerstone of asthma therapy, some parents 
are apprehensive about these drugs how do you reassure them uh, i tell them that first and foremost that this is the drug that will save your child and i assure them that while it is most necessary and most effective i also tell them that this is most safe provided it is used judiciously in a proper way i further add to say that this is not the usual steroids that they know of which is given orally and which would possibly be harmful further i tell them that even oral steroids which are harmful are often given by pediatricians over few weeks or sometimes months but judicious correct use will not allow a child to suffer from side effect so once i convince them that an inhaled corticosteroids are most important and required for a good long term and hopefully permanent control of a disease without which you just cannot achieve it and further it is different than an oral steroids that it is so much safe it is a must that the inhaled corticosteroids be used i further tell them that a long term use of a large dose for years may have caused occasionally a short height by an inch or so and nothing beyond and therefore i add up to say that none of my patients are on that long term treatment in a large dose anyway finally i end up telling them that if there was any other better alternative i would have been the first to advise that and lastly i tell them that there is a transparency in my statement that they could check up with any information access and be sure that this is the right treatment doctor inhaled steroids require regularity to be effective parents often prefer to treat the child only when he or she suffers symptoms they want to know why they should continue therapy even during a symptomatic period how do you talk to them about the need for compliance uh, i think that's very vital to tell them right at the beginning that an absence of symptoms does not mean that the child is now well controlled and again as we have been talking uh, giving similarities helps to make the patient understand i tell them that a child of or an adult of diabetes may not feel giddy or may feel fit but it is his blood sugar that needs to be normal and a patient of hypertension high blood pressure needs to be feeling well but beyond that his blood pressure seem needs to be normal so you would have an abnormal blood pressure and a normal or symptomatic patient you would have an abnormal blood sugar and an apparently normal feeling patient similarly you would have an abnormal asthmatic who apparently feels no symptoms whatsoever and once i convince them about a similarities between hypertension and diabetes they all seem to understand that a patient of hypertension is treated till his blood pressure is normal a patient of diabetes is treated to keep his blood sugar normal a patient of asthma should be treated till his asthmatic condition remains normal and that does not mean that his cough or a breathlessness should be just done not there once i convince them that therefore the symptoms disappear much faster than a disease and a disease persists much longer what we are treating is not the symptoms but a disease and that's how until the disease is controlled you cannot get away with stopping treatment because the symptoms will promptly come back when i tell them ahead of time few of the parents still go against the advice and stop treatment and just confirm that what doctor said was right that the symptoms reappear if once they reappear which you had told them well ahead of time that you would anticipate reappearance of symptoms if the treatment is stopped halfway i think they are far more convinced so i see that my half the parents are convinced by a first discussion the other half seem to not follow you and then still get online once they suffer it's very important therefore to tell them ahead of time what would happen if they discontinue treatment and i think once you tell them even when the child is apparently normal they do continue treatment i call them every 3 months and at the end of 3 months when they come well controlled i see the parents expecting now me to stop treatment 
and I tell them that this is not the time because I still feel that your child has a disease and only when I know that the disease is controlled I would minimize treatment first taper treatment first and then over time stop and at that time I tell them and remind them that the other preventive measures of avoiding trigger factors continue even when the treatment is stopped so to begin with I tell them that I'm going to give you a long-term treatment to control your disease thereafter at the appropriate time I'm going to taper your treatment and still keep you controlled and I hope at the end of some months or maybe a year or two I will call off drug treatment you still continue your preventive measures and we achieve control so we achieve control with drugs to begin with and the preventive measures thereafter we achieve control with minimizing drugs and finally we hope to achieve control without drugs but still the control is not cure and you need to be vigilant once you tell them that I think majority continue treatment as long as you want them in India sir we have many systems of medicine when parents say that they want to try a non allopathic system of treatment how do you gain their confidence uh, as I mentioned earlier that I tell them that in asthma there is no cure in any pathy having said that I tell them that there is a control possible maybe in every pathy and then I like to define control and I tell them that control is not when your child is no more breathless control is not that you don't run for an emergency but the control is when he does not even cough and what type of cough a sudden nocturnal cough an episodic cough a sudden bout of cough a child runs and coughs a child cries and coughs child suddenly coughs from nowhere is the cough that certainly means that your child is very poorly controlled and not controlled once I tell them that you follow any pathy but two things are a must when you follow any pathy one is you must achieve your destination and goal and the goal is freedom from nocturnal episodic exercise induced cough forget the wheezing wheezing should never come they should never have to phone a doctor for an emergency but not even a cough so you have to achieve your control to that extent and sustain and maintain that control for months to come that's our destination with any pathy and if any pathy achieves that control then I'm happy with that kind of pathy but then I add on to say that that pathy must be safe how do you know it is safe I tell them that primarily I would consider any drug safe if I know everything about that drug in other words the treatment should be transparent and there my pathy scores over I do not deny that other pathies may achieve control I certainly vehemently object to the statement that any other pathy has a cure it's it's absolutely a false statement but it is possible that I do not know enough about other pathies that they may also offer control provided the control is achieved as defined and further the control should be by drugs about safety of which I'm sure how can I be sure about safety only when the drug is transparent what is transparency that while I give every information about the drug that I'm using they should have an access of an official good reliable information and today on an internet or through any textbook or through any journals there is enough information access about the transparency of safety of our allopathic inhaled corticosteroids parents do tell me that some other pathies are considered very safe I first ask them that how could they say that without knowing even the name of the drug or without having an access to information and suppose it is safe take for granted is it achieving your control and destination that you had defined to begin with if your child's cough is not controlled and a wheezing is occasionally controlled however safe the drug may be it is useless so first an efficacy and a control which is a must and a safety ensured and backed up by transparency and when I tell this to the educated parents who are against allopathy I can see they wake up and then there are times when parents come back to me and say that do you think some other pathy medications contain the steroids 
to which I say I don't know. He was the person who has prescribed it. And finally I warn them that while they follow any pathy for which I would stand by them in case of their difficult situation, it should not be that a Dr. Amdekar as an allopath takes care of the emergencies and somebody else is expected to take care otherwise. If I can take care of emergencies, I also know how to take care of non-emergency control situations. So I want them to say that I don't, un don't understand any pathy which boasts of a control till it slips out of hand and then when it slips out of hand, you go to some other pathy. I don't think that is acceptable to me. And I tell them that I take charge of your patient when he is alright, when he is not under control or when he is suddenly sick because I can manage him in all three fronts and therefore once I explain to them all about it I think they understand what our pathy can really offer them but one thing is very certain that you should never talk against any other pathies unfortunately many people from many other pathies talk against allopathy and I tell them that I hope that I know a little more about allopathy than somebody else who has not even learned about it and if that somebody who has not learned understands the bad effects of my drug don't you think I also know enough about that and if that is so how can I prescribe a drug on black and white paper transparent to which you have an access once I tell them all that I think majority of my patients who swear by other pathies and are against allopathy fall back to me either immediately or otherwise. Thank you Dr. Amdekar. Today you've covered a lot of pointers that need to be discussed with parents. How does a busy practitioner manage time for this discussion? I think uh, it is very important that uh, you have to have enough time to communicate very clearly and which is uh, the entire essence of a success of therapy. So while I understand that many times the physicians have a time constraint I, I want to again re-emphasize that spending time uh, is a must and there is hardly any alternative. However, not each time this is something feasible. So I may suggest two alternatives. The first and the best would be that a physician could make a presumptive diagnosis of asthma and tell the parents that he would like to spend uh, adequate time with them at a specified time frame that both parents and doctor are comfortable with and I feel that would be a very good idea that in a busy practice you could take some time off on a particular day for half an hour to deal with one such parent. It will go a long way to establish a good parent-doctor relationship and much more important for the success of child's treatment. If for any chance even that is not possible then I would make an attempt to summarize in five minutes what I need to convince them over half an hour and I'm sure that not all parents would be convinced by that short discussion and if they are not then they may be called again for a detailed discussion and if I have to tell them in five minutes I would tell them that look your child has an asthma he's born with this genetic susceptibility to which some trigger factors come and make him flare up so the treatment should be not my drugs alone but also your cooperation and I would explain to them the trigger factors that the house dust mite is the most important allergen and also maybe the cockroaches maybe the fungal spores from the damp walls and there could be other aggravating factors like strong smell and smoke once they take care of this and follow my drug therapy he would be very well controlled though not cured but will remain throughout life in a very healthy way then I would tell them that the drug therapy has to be prolonged and even beyond an apparent control of symptoms and finally I'll tell them that the best therapy is an inhale therapy simply because it takes care of a drug in a very small dosage and it is delivered right at the site of a disease it is extremely safe it is very effective and unfortunately that is the only way today and the best way and I would add up to say that if there was any other oral alternative I would consider it as inferior 
even when there would be one and at present there is none. Finally, I will tell them that in three months time you will find your child nearly normal, growing well, happy, gaining weight and height and that will convince them that there is hardly any side effect. I think if I can summarize, summarize this in five minutes to them, maybe few of the parents will accept all that I said but I imagine even then many may stray away from doctor to doctor, from pathy to pathy and to ensure the success and the compliance uh, there would have to be a time spent but this may be a shortcut to uh, a busy practitioner and I'm sure he should still find time some other time maybe to give in details. Well finally there could be another added uh, modalities of convincing parents about such a treatment that one could have a printed material giving all adequate information about all the issues that I talked and the parents could be told to read that and come back to a physician for any more clarification. So I feel that if the doctors can summarize in short in five minutes all important issues about asthma and then leave them with a, a pamphlet which gives an adequate information for them to read and then ask them to come back for any more clarification that may be a reasonably good idea for a busy doctor to deal with a child's parents uh, who is suffering from asthma. Thank you very much Dr. Amdekar. In your many years of practice you've seen many happy outcomes. Could you summarize some of the benefits of good communication for the child, for the parents and for the doctor-patient relationship? I think for a pediatrician there is nothing better than seeing a child recover and remain happy. And I think asthma is a classical example where you see a child suffering so badly with your proper advice and treatment is turned out into a, a happy childhood for that patient. I think the best advantage for a child is that he lives his child's life. At the end of this control of uh, asthma by proper treatment, parents are amazed to see how the child can play anytime, anywhere, how can the child eat anything what he wants and how can the child enjoy his childhood and even then sleep well and grow well and develop well and go to the school regularly and not miss and do well even in education. I think they are extremely grateful to you when they see that their child's childhood has returned back. That's the biggest advantage to a child. To the parents, there is nothing better happiness than seeing a child do so well and enjoy every bit that child always longed to be. And I recall many parents who are thrilled to know that their child can eat an ice cream or have a candy or a chocolate which they vehemently objected to and prevented him from and made him have unhappy and the parents were also very very sad about it. So they are quite thrilled to see their child as a normal child and then of course for the doctor a happiness of the parents and a child translates into a very good parent and doctor relationship and a faith that comes out of such relationship goes a long way for a doctor that I recall many patients coming through such happy satisfied parents that they would say go to this doctor and your problem would be solved. I think it's a tremendous benefit to the doctor as well. If you look back what you did was spend half an hour at your first interview and then add on further faith building exercises and what you got is far more than what you spent. And I again would urge that spending half an hour with such parent is worth everything in life for a doctor as well. So it's beneficial to all. Dr. Amdekar, it has indeed been a pleasure and a privilege to hear your many practical pointers on enhancing the relationship with patients through effective dialogue. Thank you.